played Dota 2 for thousands of hours. But you've always wanted something more. A reason to fight. A deeper meaning to your battles. But to know the hidden history of Dota 2, you must go on an adventure of a lifetime. An adventure into the law! don't really get a lot to work with these days. Siltbreaker was amazing, but it was a pretty isolated incident, building on the lore of the world, but not really going into the characters or the general history. We used to get the majority of our lore from item descriptions, but uh, yeah, they decided not to do that anymore, unless it's some high quality immortal or arcana. But the rare lore updates that we do get are from new heroes, and we got a massive boost to the lore with the new Dueling Fates update. Two new heroes, each with more voice lines than ever before, detailing their relationships with heroes, the stories of the world, and many new mysteries. This is the focus of today's episode, where we will cover all of the new lore given to us by the Dueling Fates, but also talk about the new questions and mysteries these heroes give us for the future. There is a ton of things to get through here, so let's just jump in to the secrets of the Dueling Fates. To begin, let's go over all the new locations revealed to us by Willow and Pango. First up is Iron Fog. We know pretty intimately about Dark Reef Prison, the underwater prison where criminals like Slark are held in guards that may or may not be Slardar Patrol. But Iron Fog appears to be the Groundwalker's version of a high security prison in a world of incredibly powerful beings. All we know about Iron Fog is that it is filled with machines, and the events that transpire there are, uh, less than pleasant. When Dark Willow meets with Tinker, she says the following about this mysterious place. You think I'm scared of robots? You know how much time I spent in Iron Fog? Which gives off the impression that she was once in prison there. Willow believes that the things that happen at Iron Fog are so horrific, even the representation of nightmares could learn a thing or two from visiting. Hey Bane, have you seen what they did to people in Iron Fog? It'd be great research for that nightmare thing you do. Now this isn't the first time that we have seen some big terrifying machines in the Dota 2 world. In Siltbreaker, the large Galvanite Galers, I think a Galver is another word for a Jailer, patrol Dark Reef Prison and may be an example of the type of abominations that patrol the Iron Fog, if it is a prison. Of course, there's a chance that Iron Fog isn't a prison at all. It could be a city or a settlement created by clockwork machines who torture and kill any living creature that happens upon it. The smog from their bodies coating the surrounding area in a thick fog of pollution. The only sounds emanating from that fog are the clanging of metal and the screams of humans. In the end, we don't really know. Be it a place or a prison, Willow gives us some pretty good sounding advice. Word of advice. Never visit Iron Fog. Next up on our tour of places you probably shouldn't visit is Roseleaf, where a huge, important battle took place in the Dota 2 world. When Dark Willow was released, she appeared with her own unique page, surrounded by several items that she stole from various people and places. There was meant to be unique dialogue for every one of those relics, but for unknown reasons, they weren't actually included in the game. Now, you guys know me, you know my rule. If it's not in the game, to me, it's not canon. That's what we discussed when the Juggernaut Arcana's alternate voice pack was released, but never actually put in the game, which subsequently did get put into the game in this update, so now we have to talk about that too. Now to me, these voice lines that Willow says about these items are good enough to be canon, because she refers to things with those lines that are already referred to in the real lore that's been released in the game. So anyway, here is the skinny on one of those relics, the Legion flag that Willow stole. I found this in what was left of Roseleaf. The Bronze Legion thought they were going to fend off the Red Mist Horde. They weren't ready for what awaited them. Now, of course, the Bronze Legion is the group that Legion Commander leads, as we saw in her comic. And the Red Mist Horde was the army that Axe was once a soldier of until he murdered everyone above him, becoming their only warrior. This line itself is extremely interesting for the lore. For one, it shows that the Red Mist Horde has returned. 
Last time that we heard about the Red Mist Horde, they were wiped out by Axe, who originally began as a grunt, killed all of his rivals and generals over and over until he was the last man standing in the entire army, who surprisingly continued the Horde as that one-man army. In the description of the Blood Mist Belt, it reads, With the army of the Red Mist now a bloody heap, the Blood Mist Army rises to fill the void. Claiming that the Red Mist Army was pretty much considered gone, and a new Oglogi Horde army had arisen to take its place. Now, this battle may have taken place before Axe destroyed the whole Horde, sure. But the way characters talk about Roseleaf, it sounds like the fight was pretty recent, and the Red Mist Horde is back in full force. This line also alludes to the strength of the Bronze Legion, who we've never really known the numbers of before. Now, a Roman Legion in real life consisted of about three to 6,000 warriors, but it looks like the Bronze Legion could be just as large, or if not larger, a full roaming and fighting force, perhaps the only ones that could stand up to an Aglogi Horde. Alright, so with all that background aside, what exactly happened in Roseleaf? Well, eh, we don't know much, but here's what we know. Now, the Legion set up positions to fend off the Red Mist Horde, and the Horde came in full force at them. A battle took place so large and gruesome, it attracted the Bloodseeker himself, who presumably arrived to soak up the spilled blood of warriors, and uh, probably spilt a little bit of blood himself. Willow says to the Bloodseeker, Oh, I saw you years ago in Roseleaf. Kept my distance, though, you know, so I wouldn't get murdered. Now, while the battle raged, something weird happened. Something that we don't understand exactly what it could be. But one hint is, the trees themselves might have entered the fray. What both sides don't realize is that where they clashed on happened to potentially be the sacred ground of the tree and protectors, who uprooted themselves and entered into the battle. Willow comments to Tree and Protector that she... I admired what you did in Roseleaf. I mean, it was stupid, but admirable. Painting the picture that Trian and his people got themselves involved in the battle, and they seem to have been pretty successful. As Pango says to Legion Commander, You ripped what you sowed in Roseleaf, Trasdan. You will get no sympathy from me. Now with all that in mind, it seems like the trees were able to decimate the battle, at least on the Legion end. In my mind, I imagine the Legion was trying to secure an entrenched position in front of the forest, or maybe within, and the plan was to fall back through the thick wood to retreat, only to find death on both sides, when the Red Mist started fighting on one front, and the trees that they planned to fall back to came alive and started fighting them on another. So in the end, what was the significance of Roseleaf? Well, for one, I think it might be the incident that began the Tree of Protector's story mentioned in his lore. In his lore, it reads that he hails from a land near the Augury Vale, where his kind killed any that came to destroy the woods, until there was an incident that sparked the curiosity of the Treants and forced them to send a lone protector to leave the wood and report on the outside world. Perhaps Roseleaf was the name of the previously unnamed place Treant protected, and this was the battle that forced him to explore the world to investigate on behalf of his people. Willow tells Treant, Leaving Roseleaf was a mistake. And we can imagine that one of the first places that Treant visited from the Augury Vale was the Augury Bay, where he massacred Timbersaw's people and drove him insane. But that's a story for another day. You won't catch Timbersaw anywhere near Augury again. I don't know how close you are to Timbersaw, but if you care about his safety, tell him to stay clear of Roseleaf. Alright, so these places have been pretty dark so far. Let's uh, go out on a lighter note with White Spire. Now, according to the lore, White Spire seems to be a uh, sleazy den of gambling, drinking, and other nefarious deeds where heroes, people, and creeps can go and make some not too to, uh, honorably earned gold. And wherever there's gold, there's the Bounty Hunter. Dante and Willow have both met Bounty Hunter at White Spire, which seems to be his uh, normal hangout, typically at the courier races. The Dota 2 version of horse racing where patrons bet on couriers for some high stakes action. Meepo and Willow enjoy going there to spend some time and some coin they earn from their stolen or tomb raided gems. When the battle's done, you and me are going to White Spire to play the courtiers. And Pangler warns to never bet against Gondar the bounty hunter. Be careful betting on the courier races. Gondor does not play fair. Which is pretty hilarious, as it implies that Bounty just straight up kills couriers that he doesn't want to win, much like he picks off couriers in the real game. Sad, but topical. Speaking of seedy places, one with a lot of history but pretty mysterious is Weeping Rose. Weeping Rose is a place of much wealth. 
Perhaps it's some kind of bazaar, but I think it's more like a city. A place that could go in between several trade roads, and it's a place where you can spend and do some dirty deeds. The one thing that we do know is it's a place of oddities and magic. And you can find anything for the right price, where the wealthy and powerful hold the strings and you don't want to get on the bad side of them. Willow is aware of the wealth stored within the vaults of Weeping Rose, and hopes to one day pilfer them. I'd love to pick your brain on how to rob Weeping Rose. She also remarks about the type of deals one can make there, and it seems like magical things are very sought after in Weeping Rose. I'd love to see what books you have in your collection. I'm sure there are some that would fetch a great price in Weeping Rose. It's also one of the rare examples of her mischievous deeds uh, catching up with her. Which leads me to believe that maybe this place is used to magic users like her. Not many people can say they've been kept out of Weeping Rose, but I am an exceptional talent. However, while the characters tell us that Weeping Rose may look like a normal trade hub on the outside, there are some pretty sinister going-ons in the underbelly of the city, which may include slavery. Willow tells Medusa, I heard a rumor of some gorgons being moved through Weeping Rose. Now the phrasing moved through kind of implies that they were being put on sale or transported via channels in Weeping Rose. The gorgons most likely being Medusa's sisters, who were kidnapped from their home for, who knows, by mysterious invaders. All we know about the gorgons is that they are female, immortal, and supposedly beautiful, so use your imagination as to why they were hunted and sold to the highest bidder. Weeping Rose may not only be for trafficking slaves, but also for some other magical oddities. Pango warns Lion that, I know you seek Albar in Weeping Rose, but be careful. All of the Quorum's gifts have strings attached. Implying the Lion may be attempting to enter Weeping Rose to be safe from those who seek revenge on him, be it those from his old tribe or maybe the demons that he wronged, but him seeking shelter may be putting him in danger itself. This group of powerful and influential people who control Weeping Rose are called the Quorum, and uh, they sound like some pretty bad guys. But luckily for us, it appears that they have a few enemies. Alexa told us a long time ago that the Monkey King himself had fought against them. Either way, if you're looking for magical oddities, magical slaves, or just anything in between, Weeping Rose seems to be the place to go. Now much like Weeping Rose, we're introduced to a similar but even shadier place known as Revtel, a cutthroat nation led by merchant kings where you are just as likely to make a sale as get murdered. Revtel was the home of Dark Willow, her father being one of the merchant kings himself. She tells us a lot about the city life with lines like, Revtel was a city of riches and delights. And if my father wasn't one of the merchant kings, perhaps I would have stayed. The merchant kings were rich and powerful, apparently rule their domain through fear and tyranny, as a terrible monarch like the Wraith King tends to remind Willow of home. I lived in Revtel long enough to know the difference between order and tyranny. Other heroes have some similar dealings with Riptail. Phantom Assassin's Order of the Sisters of the Veil vale apparently have performed some assassinations there, leading the merchant kings to plot revenge. Word has spread about what happened in Riptail. The merchant kings will not be too happy with your sisters. And Gondar the Bounty Hunter has apparently been hired by Dark Willow's father to retrieve her and drag her back to his side at any cost. I'm never going back to Riptail, Gondar. Try to force me and you're a dead man. From the sound of it, I think I agree with Willow here. Revtel may not want to be a place somebody stays for too long. Our last place to visit, well, may not be a place at all. It is the Tyler Estate. Perhaps a group of people, or a secret society, perhaps just a place that such a society calls home, all we know about the Tyler Estate is that they are not fans of magic, as displayed by their two most recognizable members, Silencer and Anti-Mage. Magic and mystical creatures fear the henchmen of the Tyler Estate. Magic users, much like Willow. I'm not going to the Tyler Estate! You think you can drag me to the Tyler Estate? Yet strangely enough, they don't seem to be viewed as particularly bad guys. Pango and Juggernaut, both very honorable and sensible swordmen, don't seem to mind spending time alongside those who are associated with the Tyler Estate. I'll go things at the Tyler Estate. We heard about your partnership with the Tyler Estate. How's that working out? Which leads me to believe that the estate may not be a group hell-bent on destroying magic users in general, but more specializing in hunting down powerful and dangerous abusers of magic and witchcraft. 
Willow asks Annie Mage. I heard your silencer's errand boy now. True. And she asks Silencer. How's teaming up with Anti Mage working out for you? Pango's also aware of this relationship, telling Annie Mage. I think it's great. You and Silencer are spending quality time together. Now, my best guess for where this relationship comes from, perhaps the Tyler Estate is the home of the Aodryas. I, oh, I'm definitely not saying that right. The group that had created Silencer through selective breeding to make him the ultimate mage. I would imagine that after killing all the other mages he was raised with, he alone became the leader of this cult and transformed it into a group of those who were wronged by magic and protected the world against it. This, of course, attracted the anti-mage, whose life was ruined by magic users and who currently is described as a agent of the estate, as he's sent out to deal with powerful magic users by Silencer, much to his enjoyment. Where it is the Tyler estate has you on retainer. Overall, the group seems pretty fascinating, as we don't really know much. Could they be an evil cult that kidnaps and tortures magic users? Or are they actually the good guys, a band of heroes protecting the worlds from evil and untapped magics? Well. I guess only time can tell. Since I have no idea if the Tyler Estate is a group of people or a place, I guess it makes sense to move from places to groups of people. Another group we are introduced to in Dueling Fates is the Jasper Circle, a deadly assassin order, with members such as Ricky in their roster. You work with the Jasper Circle, right? The Circle is known for their deadly dealings, but also seems to be held to a code of professional ethics and honor that makes them a pleasure for potential clients to work with. While Dark Willow was taught by them in The Art of Murder, she opted not to join due to her rebellious nature and lack of interest following their rules and orders. That probably wasn't the wisest idea to turn down the Jasper Circle, but I'm no one's errand girl. The Jasper Circle always wanted to have it both ways. Naughty deeds mixed with professional ethics. It was never going to be for me. While the Circle seems to hire from within, training their agents, their values and techniques, it also appears that they are known to hire third-party agents. As Willow asks Nick's assassin, You ever work with the Jasper Circle? One hero that we know of that has used their services before, although we have no idea if this was to assassinate someone or just borrow some cash, is Meepo, who doesn't seem to have the money to pay back the assassins that he borrowed from. You owe this Jasper Circle a considerable debt, no? Listen, Meepo, I'm not saying the Jasper circle wants to kill you, I'm just saying that they're losing faith you're going to pay them back. Perhaps this explains why Meepo is in the fight to begin with, attempting to make the gold that he needs to pay off the assassins he owes money to, but more than likely, he just thinks that he can weasel his way out of pissing off the deadliest assassins in the world. Either way, the group is known for being the best, and there is hardly a kill where the Jasper Circle couldn't do it better. So we've seen new places. We've heard about new groups, but Dueling Fates also introduces us to a ton of new people. A ton of new characters that have never been mentioned or alluded to ever in the lines. So let's get through them all. First up is Sorla Khan. Now you may have heard about Sorla before in the previously unused Juggernaut Arcana voice pack, which again, wasn't canon until Dueling Fates. From that pack, we learn that Sorla now leads the army of the Red Mist. This is why Sorla Khan took your place but she somehow seems to be even more of a menace than Axe was when he was in charge. Axe, when this battle is over, we must discuss what to do about Sorla Khan. Pango has fought against Sorla before and managed to survive, claiming that she is stronger than Axe. After fighting Sorla Khan, you are a sorry disappointment. He also implies that she's a bit of a brutish meathead, as Disruptor was extremely offended when he compared her to him. I apologize for lumping you in with the Red Mist Orb. You're nothing like Sorla Khan. Axe seems to be less bloodthirsty than Sorla Khan, which is frankly terrifying to imagine. You're much more reasonable than Sorla. So the big question is, who exactly is she? Well, there's a few theories. Some thought that she was the wife of Axe since they share the same name, but it's more likely Khan is a title rather than a name. Khan being the title given to the leader of the Horde, much like the real world Genghis Khan and Papa Khan of the Fallout lore. But it's a mystery, even to Willow. Hey Axe, is Khan a last name or more of a title thing? However, even if it is a title, that doesn't mean that there may have not been some romantic relationships between Axe and Sorla in the past. We don't have any clear answers yet, but hey, that might be my guess. 
Head get an alert, perhaps Sorola was romantically involved with Axe, either formally or informally, or just regretted a one-night fling. But I imagine now that she most likely hates him. Axe single-handedly destroyed the Red Mist Horde, and now that there is a new Red Mist army, Sorla is the leader. One that prides herself in tradition, who built a new horde from scratch, honoring her Glogi ancestors and bringing it back. We know the Red Mist is marching again after the events of Roseleaf, and we know that Sorla is a tough, badass leader who seems to be marching with some kind of mission. I believe that that mission is to bring glory back to the Oglogi, to hunt down the arrogant soldier that nearly destroyed their culture with his nepotism. The fearless and bloodthirsty psychopath leader of the Red Mist Army brings glory and honor to what it once lost, and hunts the idiot who may have destroyed it. The scary thing is, by all accounts, she seems to be able to do whatever she wants, and perhaps Axe is running scared. Next up is Lauren Lassant, who seems to be an assassin of some sort, potentially the leader of the Jasper Circle. When Pingo kills Meepo, who we all know owes the Jasper Circle a considerable debt, he remarks that... This fate is better than what Lauren Lassant had in store for you. Willow also remarks that Lassan taught her how to get first blood on an enemy. Just like Lorlan showed me. And knows that Ricky still interacts with Lassan. How's Lassan doing? Besides that, we don't really know much. Is Lord Lassan the leader of the circle? A high ranking member? Or just the one that trains would be assassins? Uh, we're not sure yet, but we do know that if Lauren can keep up with the likes of Ricky and Willow, then they must be very dangerous indeed. And there's probably a reason why we don't really know much about them. The last couple names on our list are the more mysterious ones. Only referred to in a few lines and with no other instances or references, Pierpont and Mazzy are two names we have never heard before and hardly know anything about. Mazzy appears to be some sort of female keen as Willow asks Clockwork. You're not friends with Mazzy, are you? I hate that little runt. And Clockwork is notorious in his lines for being very friendly and knowledgeable with his extended Keen family, Sniper and Tinker. Of course, Mazzy may not be a Keen, it may just work on Clockwork machines, not quite sure. Being a creature like Timbersaw, perhaps having a connection to Iron Fog due to Willow's hate of her, but with that line being the only info we have on Mazzy, I don't really know much. Much the same, Pierpont is also a mystery, but apparently has a connection to Crystal Maiden. As Pangolier comments, Pierpont had high hopes for you. Oh well. When he kills her. Pierpont could have been CM's tutor that she traveled to Ice Rack to train under, or perhaps the leader of another mysterious group called the Sapphire Archons. You friends with any Sapphire Archons? I have some, uh, issues that I would love to have smoothed out. Which is a line that Willow says when she meets CM. What do the Sapphire Archons do, and is Pierpoint the leader of this group? Unfortunately, there's no way to be sure. Well, actually, maybe there is. Alright, it's time for us to go off the rails here and do something that we've never done, but let's move out of the world of canon and headcanon and into the world of leaks. Three months ago, Drew Wolf, Valve character artist, posted some concept art that he had done for some untitled projects at Valve on his private website. You may recognize some of the art that he made in the past for Valve, such as this axe in the custom game picture, and this incredible axe comic. Honestly, this guy makes some amazing stuff. If you're bored, go check out his site. He's got some female hero concepts for TF2, although I prefer Chemical Leos, and some dank-ass concept art for Heroes in Dota, and even plans for a freaking Dota 2 cartoon! What?! Oh my god! Suffice it to say, when he drew and posted this stuff a few months ago, I was, uh, <laughs> pretty excited. But little did we know that in these pages of characters, there were some secrets. Check out this little character design released a full month before Dueling Fates. Look familiar? Oh yeah, that's goddamn Pangolier. Valve back in the day was working on an untitled fantasy game way before Dota 2, and in that game's concept art, you see a few familiar faces as well. Who's this guy? Oh, those are jungle creeps in Beastmaster's Boar too? Okay, okay, sure, whatever. Maybe these are just coincidences or old assets being used. Using old assets is video game making 101. But oh, what's this? Scrolling around in the character selection of the untitled fantasy game character concepts, we find this. Pierpont the Sapphire Archon and Mazzy the, uh, Trouble? 
Do you have any idea what this means? This means that potentially every single hero designed on this page has a chance to be canon in the Dota 2 universe. Every character he drew here could be a new hero or at least an important character. This, ladies and gentlemen, this is the speculation lore nerd goldmine. Dota 2 cartoon, people! Anyway, so yeah, we might not know much about Mazzy or Pierpont, but we do know that there's already an established backstory here, and it's in somebody's head, which is pretty cool. Alright, there's also references to Rix, who hates Legion Commander for some reason, and uh, that's all we got. Also, there's somebody called Belisano, who Legion Commander was apparently romantically involved with. Listen, I don't know why we're given these really weird Legion Commander lore parts, but, uh, hey, whatever. I'm sure it's important. Alright, this is the longest goddamn video we've ever made, so let's go to the final revelations that the Dueling Fates gives us, and that's new lore for old heroes. Willow and Pango have met a lot of these heroes before, and we learned some cool things that are pretty worth mentioning. Of course, I'll get into more of these when I talk about heroes individually, but I told you that we would talk about every single thing that the Dueling Fates reveals, so let's get to it quick style. First, we're going to go through the revelations of the now canon Jug Arcana voice pack, and then we're just going to keep on moving from there. In bullet points, apparently Necro's church went and cleansed the fields of endless carnage so that they aren't around anymore. Pudge wasn't there, so he's fine, but this explains why he's roaming around and he's not at the fields of endless carnage, and this also explains more about Necro's backstory and his people. Yep, it was Sven that split the mask of Juggernaut with something called the Adjudicator's Blade. Could that be Sane, Yasha, and Kaya? Maybe. Templar Assassin and Juggernaut used to be in a romantic relationship, confirmed. Animage Hates Invoker is now canon. Siam is officially the Warden of Ice Rack, which means that she's its protector or leader? I'm eh, not sure. Pudge, Drow, and Slark are apparently friends, according to this voice line. How's Pudge and Slark doing? Wait, 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 wait. Is that like the picture for that cartoon? Oh my god, that cartoon is confirmed! It's coming out, you heard it here first. Meepo and Willow are old buddies, most likely stealing precious gems together. Mortred is officially being used, as Willow knows her name. Somehow. Willow and Puck are old nemesises. Slardar does indeed have a connection to Dark Reef being a warden or a guard or something. Willow was directly involved in the Kunkka and Tidehunter incident, causing Kunkka's death and blaming Tidehunter for creating that problem. Could it be that she stole the Gemma True Sight during that big battle which ended up killing Kunkka? I think so. Apparently, Batrider's jungle homeland sucks. Axe also apparently hates Invoker, according to canon. Pyraxae Dragon is eaten in Revtel, meaning that Jakiro really isn't that rare. He still could be Winter Wyvern in Dragon Knight's Sun, though. Agnum apparently is still alive? Shaman still hustles cities with his magic tricks, and sometimes these are the same cities as Willow, which leads to some bad results. Monkey King didn't actually escape from Dark Reef, but he claims to have, and he stole the story from Slark. Willow's father may be called the Brass Herald. Brewmaster is apparently on a mission of some kind. Lashrak did something terrible to a female that Dante knew, perhaps twisting her as he himself had been twisted. That female may still be alive. Lion and Pangolier have met before, and Pango let him go. Ice Rack makes some dope white wine. Dante is also confused as to why the Dark Moon and the Dark Moon event are named after the same thing. The thing that they're apparently trying to stop? Who knows. Night Stalker has bad breath, according to canon. There is another powerful sword called the Apiosis Blade. Is that saying Josh and Kaya? I don't know. Something called the Ghoul Rebellion happened? Not quite sure what it was, but it maybe had something to do with the Beastmaster Rebellion thingy? I don't know. Zeus turned into a swan and had sex with somebody. Yeah, that's that's real. And there you go, that's just about everything in the new game when it comes to lore. So many new things, so many new questions. Will we see these new lands in a lore campaign much like Silkbreaker? Will these new characters appear as heroes or something else? What are the new revelations from the confirmed Dota 2 cartoon? Holy shit! Who knows? But I do have a guess. What could potentially tell us a little more about these characters? What could potentially let us meet some of them and visit these new places? I have a guess, but we will see. Alright, I'll just be real. If this shit isn't an artifact, you can call me a crazy person. This, this, this is an artifact! This is art- they're pointing at artifact, boys! Artifact! The lore! 
All right, well, thank you all for watching Lorgasm. Uh, as always, it's been a pleasure. Sorry for the long wait on this one. It was extremely busy putting together a couple of events, uh, Captain's Draft 4 and Midas Mode. But now that I am back with those events, hopefully we'll be able to get these back out there quicker and more efficiently. Hope you had a great time on this long episode, and a special thanks to all the artists and people that helped me out. You can check all their links out here and below. Thanks, everybody. Of course, if you want to see more of the Lorgasm. If you want to be part of Lorgasm, head on over to the Patreon where I fund these bad boys. Again, I don't take any money from my Patreon. I use it for these artists and to fund these projects. So go nuts if you want to support the Dota community and also support me. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope to see you again for Lorgasm and hopefully Artifact. Release Artifact and the cartoon. Thank you.